So we didn't do this for the first one. We just did it by sight. Oh, yikes. Um, eyeballing these things in is not, uh, not advised. This reaction video sponsored by Nationwide Industries, but Nationwide Industries is more than just a sponsor. I legitimately enjoy doing business with them, both with the Cornerstone 2 hinges and the Trident latch that we use on our pool gates or on their full line of chain link hardware. They're great people to work with. I appreciate them a lot. If you're looking for a supplier, you should check them out too. Nationwide Industries, the fence pros, number one choice. All right, guys, today's video is titled DIY Fence on a Budget from the Andrew Thrawn Improvements channel. To watch this video, the original video, and its entirety, we'll always include the link in the description below. Let's get into it. Hey, what's going on, everybody? This video is going to show you how to build a fence. Specifically, how I took the nasty fence you just saw and completely transformed it into the fence you're seeing now. Video may be off to a little bit of a bumpy start checking out the reveal, meaning the amount of picket left above the 2x4. Looks like there's quite a bit of reveal here. And I'm sure they'll get into it in the video, but the reason why we like a 6-inch top reveal and a 6-inch bottom reveal so that there's not a lot of extra picket left above the 2x4 that can really start flexing. Especially, this looks like it's treated pine material, which likes to warp and twist. The more structure you put on this fence, the better. You want the top and the bottom reveal to be roughly six inches. This video is gonna show you how to plan for and map out your fence installation, and also spell out all the materials you're gonna need. Oh, let's check this out. So he included a price breakdown, which is awesome. Treated pine materials have done some wacky things since then. Boy, if I could buy a picket, even a pine picket, I know it's a pine picket, but still at $1.63 each. I think those are significantly more expensive today. Two before, but eights were four sixty seven. dollars It's funny how this is kind of like a time capsule of like the before times. Next, I'll show you how to properly install your vertical 4x4 posts. It looks like he's using new 4x4 posts, which is always a good idea. <laughs> Sometimes on the service side, we'll get requests saying, you know, the pickets and 2x4s are kind of at the end of their life, but the posts are really solid. Can we reuse the posts, just put new pickets and rails up? We don't like to do that. I mean... I the answer is typically no, because the posts are what's going to fail on the on the fence first. The it, we rarely replace a fence because of failure in the pickets and two before us. Now they could they could look bad. They could just look. They could be in really rough looking condition, but still be pretty solid. It's typically the fence posts that fail first. So what I'd really hate to happen is we come, we peel off the old panels, the pickets and rails, leave the existing posts, and install new, brand new pickets and rails on these existing posts. And then maybe the post fail in a year, maybe two. And then we're back to ripping it out and starting all over again. There's not there's not really a use case of reusing new-ish pickets and rails. It hardly ever happens that we can pull them off and have them be in good enough condition to go on back on. Typically, we'll use ring shank nails for stability. But when you go to pull a picket or a rail off, typically you got to do quite a bit of damage to that picket or the rail to get them off due to the ring shank nails, you're typically not able to reuse them. So I like that he's starting with new posts. We're off to a, we're off to a better start. I was afraid, it, bump start in the beginning with the reveal. We're smoothing things out. Horizontal two by four braces. I'll show you how to install the fence pickets and what tools you're gonna need. And if you follow all that, you'll be left with a nice clean fence installation. The old uh, privacy fence against a chain link fence. That, that request we actually get quite a lot too is put the finish side out right up next to a chain link fence. Be interesting to see how he handles that as well. I like this horizontal fence though. So it's kind of like a fence within a fence. So maybe, so probably like a trash receptacle, something like that. I tell you what, let me know in the comments below right now what you think this is and maybe he'll tell us at the end. So the only thing worse than not having a fence at all is having a terrible. That's kind of an interesting looking fence there that he's taking down right now. It kind of looks like what some would call like a pallet fence maybe. Interesting look. Now, before we go any further, I want to talk about the anatomy of the fence. So what you're going to need is a 4x4x8 post to secure the horizontals, and you're also going to need your 2x4. So the 4x4x8 will suffice in kind of the southern half of the United States, predominantly, specifically, uh, where your frost line doesn't exceed 2 feet, give or take. To meet ASTM standards, you'd want these holes to be 30 inches, but you can float the post in that 30 inches. But in the northern climates, you're going to have to go down significantly deeper to get past the frost line. Now, 
some people will debate whether or not you have to be below the frost line, but the danger of not setting your post deeper than the frost line is that over time, the frost will likely heave that post up out of the ground. Suffice to say, four by four by eight post is sufficient when in the southern half of the United States where the frost line doesn't exceed 24 to 30 inches. He's got his whole, the diagram says two and a quarter feet. Uh, so not quite the 30 inch ASTM, but better than the 24 inch that you see in a lot of cases. So again, off to a decent start. Two by four horizontal braces, which are gonna be secured with two screws on each side. Make sure that you actually mount your four by fours in about. So it's interesting, he's going wood two by fours to wood post, but securing them with screws. You see screws used more on the DIY side than on the actual installation, like the professional installation side. On the professional installation side, you start thinking about economics and efficiencies of installing this fence. And like I said before, we use ring shank nails my experience, our experience since 1955 has been that in our climate, ring shank nails don't pull out of the post unless the post is already rotted and ready to be replaced anyway. I haven't seen one prematurely prematurely uh, extract itself from the post. One case we will use screws, though, when we're using a steel postmaster post or a, I understand there's other posts out there, lifetime post, Gregory post, whatever. Then we will use a screw because we're going through the steel post typically with pre-drilled holes, but through those holes into the two befores and screws make more sense in that scenario. Regardless, he's going the extra the extra mile, the extra effort in installing screws. Uh, two screws per each side of the two before is correct. Two feet of concrete, and then install your pickets one after the other with two nails going in each horizontal brace. Next up, I recommend that you take the time to map out the perimeter of your fence. And to do this, I recommend that you install the corner post first, then take a string line to establish the perimeter. At that point, use some spray paint to mark each post location eight foot on center. And if you take the time with that, you won't need to cut any of your two by fours. Yeah, eight foot on center is right. I mean, that way you use a two by four, a full two by four without having to cut it down and have waste and loss. Now your sideline depends on how your layout is. If you're absolutely dialed into exactly where these posts are going to go, well, there's a few ways of doing it. You can lay the posts out with a remainder, meaning that last section is going to be your short section. You can also do a feathered approach, which is our preferred method, which the last two to three sections, depending on the remaining distance, last two or three sections are your less than eight foot so that hopefully, you know, if you have three sections that are seven, six, they kind of blend into the rest of the fence. Sidelines though, Unless we're just really dialed in, you've got some room to maneuver there. Maybe it doesn't have to go exactly to the back corner. In this drawing, he's got it going halfway up the house or part of the way up the house. Uh, so you can probably get away with doing exactly even sections there. But on the back, I'd be interested to see how he does the remainder. He'll probably do one short section, which is pretty typical on the DIY side. Nothing structurally wrong with that. That's not going to lead to a weaker fence. Uh, but aesthetically, it's a little bit more pleasing to the eye if each of the sections are closer to being uh, equal sections. So with your layout established, it's time to actually install your 4x4 posts. So use either a post hole digger or an auger to set the depth down to two feet. Check to make sure that everything's level. I'm using a level there, but you can also use a string line. And then go ahead and backfill if you need to with some crusher run, and then compact everything down. Once you have the height right, go ahead and mix up your concrete. I just went with the 480 Sacrete at Home Depot. Yep, uh, pre-mix concrete. We've, been, we've talked about this before on the channel. I like pre-bagged concrete just because you know exactly what the concrete mix is going to be in the first hole, the fifth hole, and the 32nd hole. It's all going to be the same. I understand there's some fence ninjas out there that will make sure that each particular hole is mixed exactly right, even when hand, hand shuffling and mixing the concrete themselves. Totally understandable. When we're talking about repeating this process over multiple crews, it gives you a little bit, gives us more peace of mind to have a pre-bagged concrete. That way we know out of the gate, no matter who's mixing concrete that day, it's gonna be a consistent mix. And on the DIY side, obviously it's a lot easier. You don't have to go pick up the separate components and try to mix them yourselves. And this particular brand is the one we use. So good to see them uh, using quality products. I mix that up in a wheelbarrow and then it was as simple as just pouring it in. I've seen some people put the dry bag in and then add water with the hose. But for me personally, I went and mixed everything up beforehand. This method is called uh, wet mix or wet set. Uh, there's kind of a 
series of conversations going on right now in the fencing community on uh, wet set or wet mix versus dry set or dry mix, the compaction method when it refers to dry setting. My opinion there is if whichever method you can repeatably and reliably produce is probably the method for you. For the DIY crowd, though, or the guys just getting started in fencing, this wet set method makes sure that it allows you to know that the concrete going in is mixed consistently. There's not dry pockets in there. It lets you know it's going to be set exactly right. And as your skills progress, then you can go on to mixing the concrete in the hole, per se, is what he had said. You draw, you pour in a dry bag of concrete, you pour in the water, you mix it in the holes or some version of that process. You know, Sean King, Mr. Fence, always talks about the uh, dry compaction method, which is absolutely viable. Listening to what he said, he's done it all over the United States and has had good success with it. Listen, I uh, we, we are doing a training out in Nashville for the uh, St. Seal University. Uh, Sean had come in and dry set, dry compacted a post. And uh, me and uh, Cannon Johnson of Jackson Fence tried to pull this thing. Two of us tried to pull this post out of the ground and couldn't do it. So I believe it works. I'm not here to say it is. it doesn't. But I guess the moral of this story is whichever method you can reliably reproduce, that's probably the best method for wherever your skill level's at. Then go ahead and check the level to make sure your post is square, and then you're good. And I did find that a lot of the existing 4x4s were in good shape, so I only replaced a handful. Now, at this point, it's time to set your 2 by 4 Okay, so that explains why he didn't uh, show the post in the receipt. Uh, again, my my thinking here is if you're repl replacing, replacing most of the posts, um, I would just go ahead and pull them on, replace them all, just for peace of mind. It keeps you from having to go back in three, four, five years and replace a few posts that you that you'd saved a little bit of money on in the beginning. Two by four horizontal braces. And to do this, I created a template with one of the two by fours to mark the approximate heights. So I guess I guess this explains the reason why there is such a big reveal from the top and the bottom is he's just reproducing the posts that are already there. But you can see from the bottom of that two by four to where his mark is from the bottom of the bottom two by four. That looks like it's probably I don't know, I'm guessing here, but ten or twelve inches. There's a, quite a bit of room there from the structure to the end of the picket on the bottom and what we're getting ready to see, I'm sure, is to the top as well. I'm afraid that would lead to these pickets really warping out of control. I went about 12 inches off the ground and then went at about the top of the 4x4 and then split the difference for the middle. But I recommend that you go with whatever height looks best to you. So for the corner, it's probably not going to be exactly 8 feet. You might need to trim your 4x4s. And I recommend that you preset the screws into the horizontal pieces. It makes it way easier when you go to mount them to the 4x4s. That's a good tip. So if you are going to screw it, pre-screw in the screws into the 2x4 to make it a little bit easier. I like that. So here we are screwing them in to the 4x4 posts, making sure that we're on target with our template. And then we just continued on down the fence line. So here we are installing each board. If you space the post properly, you shouldn't need to trim any down. The eight feet should be perfect. And keep in mind that your grade needs to be semi-uniform for this to work. Also, make sure that your posts are lining up right in the middle between the two 2x4s. So again, just pre-syncing, that seemed to be the easiest. Following the all right, so he used the remainder method with the panel. So it looks like, actually, it looks like he might have tried the feather method. It looks like those last two sections are short sections. Now, it might be perspective of the camera as well. Stretching that over multiple sections might make it a little bit different or make it look a little bit nicer. Um, but, like I say, it doesn't affect the structural integrity of the fence. Following the template here, and as you'll see, we kind of abandoned the template at this point because visually it wasn't looking great. So we started going to a visual inspection uh, height change, and we would basically just adjust as we needed so that it looked good aesthetically. You can see here that my brother's using a level just to make sure that everything's correct, but even more important than it being level, it, it's important that it just looks correct visually. So you can use level if you want, but more importantly, tweak it so that the eye doesn't catch any irregularities. So with all of the 2x4 horizontal braces in place, it's time to set your fence pickets. Now this is another area where fencing professionals will differ their opinions on whether or not to use string lines uh, to set your top. We prefer to use a, a solid jig, um, which could be a multitude of different things. Mr. Fence Tool sells a straightaway. Uh, not a sponsor, don't get commissioned, but it is something that we use. The reason being, these string lines have a tendency to get off in that 
a lot of guys will run the pickets right up to the string line to make sure that they get the height exactly right. But if those pickets start pushing that string line up, you don't know until you get significantly uh, through the fence. String lines, when used properly, can work. But I would prefer to use a jig that way we're more sure that it's a consistent top line. So to do this, we established a level line all the way across to give us a consistent height for the pickets. So we didn't do this for the first one. We just did it by sight. Oh, yikes. Um, eyeballing these things in is not uh, not advised, obviously. So uh, a string line is better than eyeballing these, these pickets in, but um, oh, man, this is painful to see. You can also see the reveal of those pickets. Again, a lot of it is a perspective of the camera and the lens, but the reveal starts off closer to the top two by four, and then when it gets all the way back to the camera, it looks like it's off probably 10 inches from the top of the picket to the top of that two by four. And as you can see, it looks a little off in a couple of places. So we're hoping that using this line is gonna help us out. So we established the top there, ran the line, got it level, put it all the way to the other side and put a string level on it just to make sure we were in good shape. And then the idea is when we go to install these pickets, as long as the top hits that line perfectly, we should be in good shape. So here I am establishing the first picket on that one fence face. I'm mounting the top first and then checking the level to make sure it looks good. That's important because all the rest of your pickets are kind of dependent on the first one being level. And then I'm checking the line at the top, making sure it's flush, and then hitting it with two nails per horizontal brace. So here's a view of the other side. So that's a good rule of thumb. Six nails per picket, two per brace on a five and a half inch wide picket. Now, if nothing else, fence guys like to argue about method. Um, some some folks will put three nails in per two or four per stringer, meaning nine nails in the picket. I'm from the school of thought that on a five and a half inch wide picket, two nails per stringer, six nails total per picket is absolutely adequate to hold those pickets on and to keep them nice and tight against that two before. I'm checking the level with that line. Once it's good, I'm hitting it with two nails at the top, two nails in the middle, and oh, a bonus nail, and uh, two nails again at the bottom. And as I'm sure you can imagine, this is a very, very redundant job, but you're gonna go ahead and set each picket one after the other, hitting it with two nails per each uh, horizontal brace there, making sure it's flush with the line at the top, and also just pulling the boards in as tight as you can to the other, because they will shrink a little bit as they dry. Treated pine will shrink, so we'll cedar. In a recent live interview, we were, I was talking with uh, Caleb with San Seal Experts. The exception of this is uh, import cedar and it goes by it can go by uh, JPC Japanese cedar it can go by Chinese cedar or just import cedar if it comes in from overseas it'll actually come in very dry they'll kiln dry it because when we're shipping overseas you're worried about shipping weight so it makes sense for them to kiln dry these boards so that they can get more boards on a container ship problem with that is when they come in they're like I said, incredibly dry. When you put them up, they will absorb the moisture from the air over the course of a week or two weeks, depending on, you know, conditions, environmental conditions. But what happens is you see those pickets start popping off because if you butt them up next to each other, nice and tight, and then they swell, there's nowhere else for these pickets to go but to try to push each other off the two by fours to make room for each other. Uh, so that would be the one caveat here. If you're using a treated pine or a, uh, I would say, I say domestic cedar, but this goes from Western Red from Canada as well. They, if it goes for a non-kiln dried cedar, make sure those pickets are as tight together as possible because they will still dry and they will shrink a bit. But if you're using a import cedar from, or any import lumber from an overseas source, just know that it's likely kiln dried uh, and it will absorb moisture. So probably leave yourself a gap in that scenario. Just a little caveat. Hopefully save you some heartburn. So I'm showing you a little time lapse here of the picket installation process. You'll see you might have to adjust the grade if there's you know a lump of dirt in any location, but it really is just redundant. Line everything up, check the level periodically, hit it with the nails, 
and uh, have a good podcast on, because you're gonna be spending a lot of time doing this. I think if we worked nonstop, we could have knocked this out in a weekend, but we took breaks. It, it took us probably a couple weekends, but I was not gonna drag this out for another day, so I clocked into the night shift to bang out this last segment here. So you'll see for this front face, first I mounted a six by six post for the gate, and then I used these angle brackets just to make sure for this one face, it was flush all the way across, as you'll see here. That's an interesting approach, um, making sure making sure your uh, posts and your rails are flush. Typically, you would overlap the rails over the posts just like you had for the rest of the fence um, so that you would have a consistent look. I like that he went with a 6x6 instead of a 4x4 on his gate post. Now, the next step, the more long-term solution to this would be to use a steel post, steel gate frame with hardware that attaches each. Shameless plug. I did a I did a video about this. We'll link it somewhere. How do it? How do a professional installs a steel frame gate? Get you uh, several more years out of of life out of that gate. But I like that he went six by six instead of just going with the four by four uh, for that gate post. All right, here's where I made a bonehead mistake. I started off on the less visible side. Dumb. Always start on the more visible side so that if you have to cut the board down, you can do so on the side that's not right at the gate opening. Can't believe I did that. But hey, it is what it is. So again, I felt pretty confident about doing this visually because it was only about four feet, but I went and established the pickets, got them level with each other, and then again, two nails per horizontal two by four, and did that all the way across. Always use some sort of method to establish that top line. It'll make, it'll make your experience a lot better. So I was a little bit stupid here. Basically, I'm gonna have to rip this board down just ever so slightly because it doesn't fit in there. Um, which is not a problem. I just wish I would have started on this side and finished over there so the cut was further away. But I think it's gonna be such a minor cut that it's not gonna be a big deal. So here I am ripping that board down and it's very likely that you're gonna need to rip at least one or two boards down. For safety's sake, I would recommend using a, a table saw here rather than, uh, than a circular saw for sure. Uh, especially in fence pickets. I mean, you could hit a knot and that you could send that thing going in a direction you don't want it going to. Hopefully one that's not quite as visible as right in front of the gate, but here's how I did it. And you're witnessing a pretty big moment here where I nail in the final picket of this fence job. And there it is, two right in the middle. And that's the end of the night shift. Looks pretty good. The only thing left to do is put on your post caps and build your gate. And I'm going to show you how to build the gate in detail in my next episode of the Backyard Transformation Series. So please subscribe if you want to see that. So one of the problems with the latch is that you can only use it from the inside in this case, or if it were installed opposite, you can only use it from the outside. They make purpose-built latches where you can operate it from both sides of the gate. Uh, because invariably, if it were me and I installed a gate that could only latch from one direction, I would always need to unlatch it from the opposite direction. And I've seen, uh, I don't know, life hacks or whatever, where someone will uh, drill through the hole, drill through the post, run a string through there and attach it to something heavy like a washer or something to where they can pull it from the opposite side. It'll pull that uh, trigger up and it'll release the gate. In today's day and age, they make latches that will work from both sides of the fence. So before we do the big reveal, the last thing to talk about is the pricing and materials. So to do this, I needed to buy 480 pickets, 92 by fours, the framing nailer, the air compressor, and all of that came out to around 1600. This doesn't account for the four by fours or the nails and screws, but I'll have links to everything in the description. Again, keep in mind, this was from 2020 uh, in the before times before lumber prices really got crazy, but you know, so if you, if you added 35, 40% to this number, you would probably be in the right ballpark. The total fence length was around 200 feet. So I would estimate that we're around 12 to $14 per linear foot of fence, which is, is not too bad. All right, let's check out the final product. I think it turned out great, guys. I mean, with a few caveats, the reveal above and below, 
Uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments below of this fence. How'd it go? What would you have done differently? I mean, we're all here to learn from each other and our shared experiences. Always love hearing what you guys have to say in the comments below. I try to interact with you guys as much as possible in the comments. So if you have a question about how this got done or how I would do it differently, and I hadn't expanded on that, drop that in the comments below. Until next time, I'm Joe Everest, the fence expert, reminding you that good fences make good neighbors.